Testing, testing. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, it's 11.50, which means that it is time to make some art. Uh, so uh, welcome to the Pretty Vector Graphics playing with SVG in Python session. Um, I'm just going to do a quick intro and then hand it over to Amanda J. Hogan, who's our speaker. Yay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, very quickly, uh, computing education specialist at the ACA and the president of ICTE New South Wales, uh, which is a professional association for computing teachers. Uh, secondary computing teacher for about 10 years. This is like a dossier. Uh, and has come to teaching after working in the IT industry most recently at Microsoft Australia. Uh, and Amanda is an active tutor and content creator in the Girls Programming Network. Let's give her another round of applause. Good morning. I'm going to need to do some audience warm up. So there, I'm going to be showing some stuff today, uh, and I need a lot of ooh. So uh, can I get a practice ooh, please? Ooh, very good. OK. Um, this is going to be fine. Uh, I'm not at all terrified. Uh, OK, so a couple of months ago, um, I'd, I decided to play around with SVG. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that story. But why SVG at PyCon? A lot of people said, Surely you should be talking about this with JavaScript. Um, XML is text, SVG is XML, and Python is quite good at text manipulation. And also, I know Python and feel kind of confident in the, in the basic stuff. So uh, I wanted to play around with something that I was familiar with. And F-strings, fantastic, made my life heaps easy. OK, so a couple of months ago, um, maybe six, Life is flying by me. Um, my friend Ben Taylor uh, went to a JavaScript conference and learned from Tim Holman uh, all about making generative art with JavaScript. Um, and he was using Canvas. And so we have a learning group at work. I recommend you should get a learning group. Um, and so Ben was showing what he'd learned at a conference to the rest of the team. And we were having a play with JavaScript and Canvas and, S and um, generative art based on Tim's talk. And so I'm referencing both of these people as inspiration for where, uh, where I went from there. I decided that uh, SVG was something that I was really interested in playing with. Um, and so I moved from JavaScript Canvas to SVG in Python. OK, so what's generative art? It's where you take a computer and you let it do the creative stuff because you're not creative. <laughs> Uh, and that was great for me because I am a copier. I am not a creative person. I don't come up with uh, amazing things out of thin air. But computers do. Randomness does. Pseudo-random is great. Uh, so you take your pseudo-randomness, you take a whole bunch of repetition, and you take an algorithm or something, and it makes a design. And it's been around since the 60s. This uh, drawing is actually um, done with ink on paper. It's uh, uh, done with a plotter by Frederick Nake. There was a huge movement of uh, generative art from the 60s. And it's, uh, it's getting pretty wild out there now. Um, but uh, this is where we, the simple stuff started, with just shapes and polygons. Uh, and that's kind of where I came from. So first step, you need to know how to draw a line. I didn't want to use any libraries. I wanted to know what the heck I was doing. So um, I used just uh, string manipulation. Um, so we have here. Uh, the building blocks of making a line. I've given you a couple of code snippets at the end. I have the GitHub repository where I've put everything. You are welcome to steal, hack, um, remake, improve. Please improve. Um, OK, so a line has an x starting point and a y starting point and an x ending point and a y ending point and some kind of styling. So a stroke width, a stroke color. And that's basically what you need to make a line. Uh, and if you make it randomly from top left to, to bottom right, or from bottom left to top right, uh, then when you repeat it a bunch of times, you end up with this. And you've all practiced, so? Right. OK, so repeating stuff a whole bunch of times makes this uh, makes really interesting patterns. And, they, and each time you run it, it changes. So you get this lovely. Um, yeah, generic effect, uh, generated effect, sorry. OK, so once you've worked out how to draw a line, this is good. We've made a start. So we're going to move on to basic shapes. And the most basic shape is a, is a rectangle or square. And so it starts from uh, an x, y coordinate and then has a width and a height. And you can make, the, I've made it a square when width equals height. Uh, but you can make it a rectangle. Um, 
and you have a colour, you also have a stroke. Uh, I have, I wouldn't usually have put a stroke width that was the same colour as the fill. Um, strokes can get really wacky in, uh, in behaviour when you do scaling on SVG. Uh, the strokes scale in, a, in an unpredictable way. Uh, so when you're doing massive scaling things, I would definitely not use a stroke. Uh, but in this case, when you repeat a whole lot of rectangles next to each other, uh, you get a shadow line, like a tiny micro gap between them, and it looked kind of ugly. So I put the stroke in just so that I could fill that gap. Uh, so then I went and analysed a whole bunch of Mondrian art. I don't know if you know the black and the white and the red and the blue and yellow. Um, and I did uh, a Markov chain. <laughs> I was playing around with some algorithms. I uh, did a Markov chain. That didn't work all that well. But then I um, plotted all of the colours used in a Mondrian piece of art and how big how that length was of each rectangle. And then I made a, a dictionary of, this is just explaining the craziness in the code if you ever go to the GitHub. There's a dictionary of a whole lot of numbers. Those numbers are the le lengths of rectangles coming from somewhere. That's an, an analysis of an artwork. And so you feed that back in, and then the computer can make their own, art, its art, own artwork based on all of those numbers. Uh, thank you, well done, you're very well trained. Okay, so after we've got rectangles, I moved on to circles. Um, and so circles are actually very simple. They have a center X, center Y, and a radius. Um, and so this is just my way of making multiple concentric circles uh, where you have uh, the center X and center Y doesn't change, but the radius does on a random thing. And there's um, SW is stroke width almost I'm almost consistent throughout all, everything I do, uh, and it's almost pep eight throughout everything. <laughs> I've tried really hard. Uh, and so uh, it takes a random choice, but it's weighted so that there's more ones and, uh, than there are twos and more twos than there are threes. Uh, and so once you do that, and then you steal somebody's excellent circle packing algorithm, uh, with credit, of course, uh, then you end up with this. Yeah. So it gets more complex. Uh, we're starting from the basics and moving through. Um, okay, arcs are really unpredictable. I didn't realise how, how tricky arcs work until I started playing around with them. So an arc is an intersection between a curve and a line. And when you have a curve and a line, um, it, which has, it has uh, a radius width and a radius height, so you can make an oval as well as a circle, um, you have four different arcs that can be created from that curve-line combination. And so, do you want this one, or this one, or this one, or this one? There are two flags that are ones or zeros based on which one you want. Um, and I quite liked that I had the large arc flag and the small arc flag being large AF and small AF. <laughs> that made me giggle just a little bit. <laughs> okay, so that makes an arc. Um, and when you take lots of arcs and repeat it, you get this cool thing. Yeah. This is probably one of my least favourites. Um, I, I don't think it's quite exactly what I was looking for, uh, but uh, I wanted to move on to other things, so I'll come back and look at arcs another day. All right, paths, uh, arcs are paths, uh, but paths are the most um, manipulatable of all of the um, tools in your SVG toolkit, uh, and paths can get pretty complex. Uh, so I recommend you go and uh, read up on all of the different bits that you can set in a path. Um, I'm using C, which is uh, a cubic Bezier curve, um, and C, capital C, the way SVG um, path encoding works is that you start with M, which is a, um, a starting point, and then C uh, means curve. If it's a lowercase c, it means relative positioning, and if it's an uppercase c, it's absolute positioning. And I wanted to just do everything absolute rather than trying to work out the relatives. Um, when you use something like Inkscape or um, Illustrator, it tends to create SVGs that are um, much more relative so that you can move one point and the whole thing moves. Um, yeah, I didn't want to do the maths. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what this is, this is uh, just um, a JPEG from the internet, it shows you that um, this is not really a circle. This is four cubic curves uh, that approximate a circle. 
Uh, so what I did for this one is take a circle, plot 12 points on it, turn each of those points into a cubic curve rather than an arc so that I could manipulate them individually. So you can then manipulate the point themselves and the handles. Uh, and so 12 points, 12 handles, 12 sets of handles all manipulated, you get this weird wiggly thing. Uh, that's randomly manipulated. And then if you repeat that a bunch of times, you end up with this. This is one of my favorites. Uh, my daughter wants to turn it on its side and draw a face on it. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, just that lovely hairiness as it moves across the screen is fantastic. Um, if you were manipulating SVG in JavaScript, you could definitely animate this, um, which is quite cool too. Okay, so now that I've got some random started, um, I took a field of um, quadrilaterals, uh, that these are actual squares, and then I manipulated each of the points of those squares um, randomly. So I've actually um, made sure that each point is kind of stuck to the point that it's attached, that it's um, adjacent to. So uh, once you manipulate each of those points, uh, and I wanted the border to remain the same, uh, then you end up with this wonderful tiled mosaic. Um, so this is the first time you'll see that I've added colour. I'm not a confident colour person, uh, and so I actually consulted with my child on, <laughs> on what were the best colours to use. Um, it, there are lots of ways to import colour into things. Please don't use random colour. Random colour is just almost universally bad and a different shade of brown. Uh, so uh, you should, uh, purple brown does exist. Uh, you, should, <laughs> you should go and find uh, an API for some wonderful colour schemes that real people that know how colour works have put together and uh, steal those. Okay, so once I'd moved from uh, mucking around with randomness, randomness starts to look uh, a little random. And the reason this doesn't look like a mess is because I've got the border uh, stationary. Um, so from here, I was starting to think about how I could use randomness uh, and still have it look pretty, how, how to have it look like it made sense. Uh, so if you have a bunch of random lines, but then you reflect them on uh, symmetrical axes, uh, then it starts to look like it makes sense, like it's a pattern. Uh, and so this one, this set of lines can be um, uh, reflected diagonally and then for four different quadrants. Uh, and I did that to make this kind of thing. These don't match exactly because they're, <laughs> um, uh, because it's randomly generated each time and I didn't lock the seeds. Um, and so then when you do that a bunch of times, um, people might have noticed that I tweeted this one out on Twitter. Thank you. I'm quite pleased with this. Uh, it looks a little like Space Invaders. Uh, the one that does look a lot like Space Invaders is if you do the same thing with circles. Um, so this is a randomly generated same thing of a series of circles and then I diagonally and uh, eight points of symmetry uh, reflected it and you end up with that. Uh, and so each of these pieces of code you can choose the, the, how many tiles you want um, and the, uh, just have one or have many. Okay, so once I'd mucked around with basic shapes and repetition and a little bit of randomness, I wanted to have a play with other images. So um, th there's a fantastic library. I didn't use any of the libraries for SVG, uh, but I did use a library called Pillow for um, reading the pixels in an image. So um, for this one, I decided to split it into a grid of four, and then I did some calculations. This get average color uh, function um, runs through all of the pixels in that quadrant and determines the average color for the quadrant, and then looks at the center color and determines the distance between the average color and the center color. The highest distance um, is uh, the one that has the most changes happening in that quadrant. So then it does the same thing again in that quadrant and the same thing again until I get to a small, small um, radius, which I've just arbitrarily set. Uh, and so this, this lovely picture of a, of a flower turns into this fantastic thing. <laughs> um, and this one, uh, you can definitely still see that the gerberas existed in this one. <laughs> I quite like the abstract nature of these ones. And, uh, if you wonder what a zebra looks like, uh, the answer is not like a zebra. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, but it does I come up with some nice things. And if I use symmetry on these as well, then you'd end up with a really nice tiling. Um, but I just wanted to see using seeds other than my own uh, geometric interest or randomness, what I could do with that. Uh, okay, so then we've, uh, we move on to algorithms. So this is a pretty straightforward uh, drawing a tree program. There's a little bit of difference in that I manipulate the HSL value um, based on the level I'm at in the tree. So you'll see that it fades towards the top. Um, you can use all of the different color systems in SVG, which is quite nice. Uh, so this one then repeated um, maybe 36 times, uh, ends up with this. I like that. It looks like Soren's eye or something. <laughs> Um, and so that, that's uh, the re repetition and the, uh, the HSL value is what makes that, I think. Um, and then uh, this was, this was a, a personal, <laughs> uh, just a goal of mine, uh, to understand uh, chaos a little bit, uh, not a lot, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, and so I saw that people had taken logistic maps, um, uh, bifurcating logistic maps, uh, awful things in maths, uh, and uh, they sit, uh, this is actually a turn of a logistic map because a logistic map goes that way, um, but I thought it was really pretty and looked a bit like a mountain range. Uh, that's how mathy I am. Uh, and so uh, took some uh, data processing to get to this point, uh, but between two different values, uh, the uh, bifurcating logistic map gets quite chaotic, and so that's what I get. And, and then I, I rotated it. Um, okay, so algorithms, and then we're up to, this is a, a happy accident. Uh, I completely failed to uh, get my double pendulum to work, <laughs> uh, and uh, gravity was not working for me, but it was very pretty. So uh, I kept the uh, double pendulum fail program uh, and uh, you put in different numbers and you get these amazing almost under the sea type creatures uh, and that's the great thing about generative art is that uh, accidents are actually to be celebrated that's how you get the uh, the uniqueness that's how you get the um, creativity is uh, finding little accidents so this is a uh, an anatomy of a failure I did actually finally get my double pendulum to work um, and so it's not quite generative art because it's not really random. It's going to be the same every time I run it unless I put in different starting points. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I did get the double pendulum to work. So this is my double pendulum. It's about to be revealed, so you get your ooze ready, okay? Um, so this last experiment is um, playing with the filtering that I can do uh, styling in um, SVG. And you can style in CSS with SVG, which is really useful if you're doing it on, for the web. Um, but uh, I wanted to play around with the internal styling because with strokes, you really don't have a lot of choice uh, in CSS styling. Um, so this is uh, using some blurring uh, to make kind of a glow effect. Uh, and there's my double pendulum. Thank you very much. All right, um, so what can I do with all of that? Uh, well, uh, it's, SVG is great for the web. Some of the things that I made, uh, particularly the ones that have a lot of circles, uh, are way too big. Don't use them on the web. Um, you want to make your SVGs small, and generally they're smaller than um, high, high resolution images, but they tend to be, um, if you put too many shapes in, they just get huge. You'd think that um, using a shape, defining it as a symbol and using that a lot of times would make it uh, smaller. No, it makes it bigger. Not sure, <laughs> not sure why. Uh, maybe we should get onto that. Uh, but uh, yes, so you can make impossibly big SVGs. Don't use them on the web. Uh, but for, for making banners and backgrounds and things that are uh, unique to you but uh, kind of make sense and they're pretty, uh, I think they're really nice. They're scalable so that if you have um, a responsive design, then, uh, then it will work on all the different sizes. Uh, you can make scalable logos uh, so that when you make it for a business card or for um, a poster beside a train station, then they, they can be the same image. Uh, infographics are really good. Lots of people are using SVGs for infographics. 
and you can use make a, make a character using something generative and then animate it in, uh, for games or for just basic animations. Uh, and finally, um, my friend Gavin Smith is here, and uh, he and I have hung out a little bit at Robots and Dinosaurs. And so uh, most laser engraver programs uh, talk SVG. So um, he's actually done some stuff with Mandelbrot. Uh, and this is, you can come up and have a look at these when it's ended. And this is uh, a, a laser engraved um, Sydney uh, sunset and twilight mapping. So you can see the three different definitions of twilight and uh, when sunset falls below the horizon and we have a larger version mapped with the, with the phases of the moon. And so all of this is SVG that's been built um, using the maths uh, in Python so that you don't have to do it yourself in Illustrator because that would make you cry. Um, okay, so you can have a look at the show and tell after this is uh, done. And so go forth and make. All of my, GitHub, uh, all of my uh, code is on this GitHub repo, and you can reach me at Twitter. Uh, and I'd really like to see anything you, you make, because I follow quite a lot of generative art on Twitter. Um, and that's it for me today. Thank you. We've got a little bit of time for questions. Anybody have some questions? How did you get that, started? That's because I'm comprehensive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, like what, what gave you the bug or what, uh, what gave you the bug for this? Like it's such a cool application of Python. Yeah, I, I, I really, it really was um, mucking around with Canvas in JavaScript and feeling really out of my depth because I don't really understand JavaScript. Uh, and then going, you know, uh, I, I've been doing a project with SVGs at work um, and uh, have been manipulating them in... Uh, you know, by, by dragging dots, points around in, uh, in a vector uh, illustration program and finding it really frustrating and didn't even really consider that I could um, just build the text with the numbers and stop mucking around with my mouse, uh, which saved a lot of time. <laughs> That's so cool. Come on, guys, questions? You're going to... Yeah, <laughs> Um, I was wondering if there's anything that you're working on uh, now that you haven't quite managed to get working yet, or you? Uh, yeah, there's a bunch that kind of fell into the uh, onto the um, drawing room floor, uh, just as uh, as I don't know, manipulating the numbers. They didn't quite come out the way that I was expecting. Um, I quite like the stuff from the 70s. There's a there was a big like there's books of of generative art done on. Um, plotters back then, and so uh, I, I, I really like that. I wanted to start moving into making some physical stuff. So rather than just doing the SVG, moving on to the laser engraver, or even um, using a plotter and making it on paper, I think that's quite a, a nice, beautiful thing. So as you've explored this amazing space of generative art, um, have there been any particular tools or libraries that you were like, wow, I wish someone had built that. Why haven't they built that yet? And if so, what would those do? Wow. OK. Um, so the thing that uh, I've kind of ignored in my ex exploration of generative art, um, uh, I really enjoyed the stuff that was definitely lines and shapes because I could I could see my way into how to do that. But there's there's a lot of generative art that's not really um, related to SVG that is done with um, pixel brushing and these amazing sweeps of uh, color that I think it would be so good to be able to find a way to manipulate that with um, with you know just coming up with your own uh, inputs and having the, the outputs just appear in front of you. I'd really like to uh, take this and move it into... I, I've had a play with moving it into Replit, and that's probably um, re relates to your question too, Kelly, um, that I'd like to make it more interactive so that you're not just running uh, a bunch of functions with inputs but actually just changing numbers on a web page and having the SVG appear in front of you. That's kind of cool too. Uh, that's probably next step. 
uh, that would be that would be nice for me to make that. So much brown in the world. <laughs> Oh, I've not heard of that. Um, most people I know use APIs that are made by uh, actual people. So that would be really interesting to talk about uh, in a bit more detail a bit later. What you're doing at lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Have you met Gavin? <laughs> I'm sorry, I get nervous, I go fast. <laughs> I can repeat the question back. Uh, so you mentioned animations. Uh, have yeah. you done this with animations at all? I was just kind of curious because that seems like it'd be a whole different world. Yeah. So not with Python. It doesn't. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but I have made things. Uh, uh, SVGs with Python and then animated them using CSS. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you uh, group things together and then you can set the keyframes. It's actually really nice. Uh, and um, like a Ferris wheel, for example, just uh, spinning on, on a banner is really simple to do and looks really impressive. All right, we might have one more question after this. Okay, so you talked about generative art. Yes. And in your initial um, description, you, you steered clear of using libraries because you want to discover SVG, and that seems very technical. But how do you feel about using libraries when art is a creative process? Is that stifling oh, some of the creativity? Is, is the art itself generating the algorithms? That, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I'm not a purist. I just... <laughs> I just wanted to understand uh, how the building blocks of SVG rather than just sending it to a, to a method. Um, so I think absolutely uh, from here I would be using things that had been built by people more expert than me to um, play with, because uh, it gives you more opportunity. You're not so bugged down in, oh my goodness, off by one errors. <laughs> Uh, so many, so many. Uh, and so um, you're not so bogged down in that and you're just exploring uh, what different uh, settings uh, allow you to do. I think that's m much more exciting uh, for the, from the artistic perspective. Yep. Awesome. Anybody have a last question then? Thanks. Great presentation. Um, generating SVG um, programmatically, often there are um, syntax errors, that sort of thing. Is there anything you'd recommend for linting SVG that's generated in this way? Ooh, um, uh, I, the process that I used uh, myself for finding out what the heck was wrong with an SVG when it didn't work was to... Uh, like I would make something in uh, Inkscape and then open the one that's generated by the actual graphic program that knows what it's doing uh, and then open mine and kind of play compare. There isn't really something that does lint SVG as far as I could see um, because a lot of people that are coming from that uh, creating space aren't really interested in the syntax. They just want the... So they use the package to do it for them. Um, uh, but that would be really interesting. That that would be an interesting project. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, it sounds like there's going to be an amazing discussion come lunch, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so just like that, um, can we please get one more round of applause? Big thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.